will be on the 7th. Um, and I'm discovering that since all of the lectures have not been given before, that, that some of the subjects, uh, are so, once I start digging around, are so extensive, I could probably give a whole, might be boring, but it, I could give a whole series on, on, on the subject of today's lecture, which as I've um, quite directly titled it, The Advantages and Disadvantages of Being English. Just before I start the lecture, just out of interest, how many people here by show of hands are actually English? Oh, more than I expected. Uh, for, you, for those of you who are, um, the, the, the remarks will be, I hope, not embarrassing, and you're quite at liberty to disagree with me. Not that I particularly know what I'm going to end up by saying today, uh, because I think the, the delight of discussing culture whether it's sort of national culture, architectural culture, or any other culture, any other mixture of circumstances which we uh, ascribe to that terrible word, culture. Um, the thing is that, of course, most of it is paradoxical. Most of it can be argued till kingdom come, has no uh, rules to the argument, nor rules to that which leads up to it. Um, it's more if you like, the observations of somebody who has been around for a while, or in fact, defense mechanisms. I think that a very important thing that, that I can advise many of you who are, going, who are entering that very tricky world, which is called being an architect, is that just as important as talent, opportunity, even in some cases <coughs> money and connections, is... is Survival is, is the ability to, to parry with rather like a box, you know, rather like boxers have to do. It's, the, 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 it's not even as, as, as direct as being tactical. It's actually building up certain defense mechanisms uh, which uh, take advantage of your abilities and inabilities as much as they uh, are to defend the hidden weaknesses, some of which are not very hidden at all. And as I've discovered over 40 odd years as a teacher, the important thing um, uh, of, for my sort of teacher has been finding out, out about the punters. And then, not in a nasty way taking advantage of their foibles, but actually working with their foibles, rather than some abstract set of values. But that's my position. That I'm, I'm fascinated by people. Um, and I'm fascinated by things that happen out in the street or, you know, between the gents from and here or getting off a bus, whatever it might be, the, the, the way in which uh, people behave. And I think that although it's dangerous territory, this, in, 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 a, in a community here which has a majority of non-English people, uh, and I say English deliberately because I think if I'm a Scottish, it, there would be certain nu different nuances. Um, that when I came as a student here a very long time, more than half a century, well, no, just about a half a century ago, so I can thought, um, it was very English. This school was very English. It was very properly English. It was a sort of English public school domain, which a few of us spotty grammar school provincials were allowed to sort of enter. Uh, on, on the sufferance. And I went to a terrible event uh, about half a year ago, uh, which was a reunion of our year at, at the AA. And I realized how many pompous farts there were <laughs> around and how there were only about three people I'd really want to cross the street to talk to. Now, that's not me being superior. It's just that it was a very, very different atmosphere. But there was one thing that was... Uh, extant at that time, which was a certain kind of English way of discussing architecture or conversing rhetorically. And I once, I'm going to show a picture of a building by a man called Neve Brown, who you may or may not have heard of, older even than me by some distance, who I remember once telling, once I got to know him, years afterwards, I said, when you used to come on your, when you used to come on our juries, you had a very loud voice, 
Now, I'm not known to have a quiet voice, but he had an extremely loud voice. It was as if one said, this is what you do in architecture. And being born in America, but an Englishman, he could do it louder than anybody else. And it was very particular. It's rather like when you listen to those old radio programs from even 30 years ago. Even my lovely, lovely dear friend Michael Webb, who's lived in the States probably for nearly 40 years, he sounds like English was then. Because he hasn't been standing waiting for a bus on the Bulls Pond Road or listened in to much television or gone in pubs lately. So his, 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 it's, it's an ossified. Now, what I'm, but I'm stick to the point, which is that there is a certain way of discussing architecture, uh, which, and it's again a post-rationalization. I have a non-English a non wife who was a student here many years ago. And she said, we never quite knew what you were getting at, because you didn't say something was good or something was bad, as they do elsewhere. You would say, hmm, it's rather interesting. <laughs> or, have you thought about? She said, we can never make out what you meant by have you thought about. Because we weren't saying, you must read that, or you must do that. It was sort of, perhaps, maybe a certain kind of. And I said, look, to me and people of my ilk, if you say, that's good, that's bad, you'll foreclose the conversation. Because it might be interesting. You might be a wanker, but it might be interesting. <laughs> It could possibly be. You might be untalented, but there may be a possibility that the same idea developed and in more talented hands could have validity. And this sort of concept of the... It's not a... It's, and I had to... Exp it's taken me nearly 20 years to explain to her that it's not a question of opting out. It's a, qu it's a question of being more interested in the process of arriving than necessarily that the... That the project or the idea at that moment in time was definitively okay or not okay. On the other hand, the underbelly of that condition was a certain kind of um, correctness, which I'm glad to see, an, a, a, a pompousness, which I may have inherited, God help us, uh, which I'm glad to see has, has gone away, that, it's, that if you were like Neve Brown with his loud voice on the jury. Nice man, though he is. Uh, you would not be tolerated now. Um, because it would seem to be more dogmatic. Or at least you can't be dogmatic now in English. You can be dogmatic in another language, use in, in, from another place using English, because people always, if, they, if they're slightly offended, say, oh, well, it's lost in the translation. The fact that it might not be lost in the translation is a byway. I start off with the Turner painting, which I hadn't realized when I just screened the thing off out of a book, but is actually meant to be showing a castle. It's one of those, it is actually near the castle, never heard of it. <coughs> painting of 1804. And the painter Turner, I mean, the, the more boring amongst one's uh, people you read about say, well, actually, he, was, he suffered from an eye deficiency. The less boring say, no, it was all imagina it was imaginative. And those of us who don't care say the result was all right. What the hell does it matter whether he had an astigma or not? But the ambiguity is the key thing. But within the ambiguity, you can read all sorts of conditions and you probably didn't know it was a castle till I told you. And I didn't even know till last night when I double-checked what the caption said. Uh, now we, of course, associate it with being a castle. We perhaps focus into castle mode. And we say, yes, of course, Peacock's trying to tell us something about castles, which as a child I used to collect. I used to persuade my parents to take me in the car to all sorts of stupid places so that I could add to my collection a castle, uh, which I gave up when I started reading Le Corbusier <laughs> at the age of 14. But until that time, I had a big collection of castles. Um, on the other hand, there is the precision of, of things that are ambiguous, if that's not a strange contradiction in terms. The attraction um, of the Soane Museum, 
is its quirky but considered tricks that, that this rather successful and rather brilliant architect, when it came to his own abode, was able to push things to the extreme uh, and enjoyed the contrivance of tricks and ambiguities. And we go there and we enjoy them sort of second hand as a, as a formal place. The question to what extent Soane was English, uh, it immediately comes up. To what extent he, <coughs> he played with and bent neoclassic rules. Um, after all, I guess we can argue that there are more classicists who bent the classical rules than there were ever classicists who followed the classical rules, assuming that there are extant classical rules. In the funny old place that I studied in before I came to the A, we were the last school in England where you were forced to draw by proportion all the five orders of architecture. You were then forced to draw them in axonometric. You were then taken into the countryside to put pieces of lead around the mouldings of churches uh, and then to document them. Uh, and that was weird, and one thought, what a waste of time, being somebody who already for two or three years had been reading Le Corbusier and other things. Um, now, is it a hardening of the arteries? I've forgotten until I remember. Sometimes uh, I, I wouldn't waste any of my students' time on doing all that. On the other hand, it gave you something to fight against, and it gave you something to that you sort of had this terrible love-hate relationship because there it was and there was a lot of it and it was a sort of English wing <coughs> of a, an enormous culture, you know, of, in a sense, 2,000 years as well as recent history, meaning 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And it was a, it was a difficult thing to fight, um, rather like, you know, fighting uh, a three-course meal. And there have been, of course, weird extensions of that. There is the whole instinct of the English to play. In that respect, I always find a great similarity with the Japanese. Is that I think uh, if only one could speak Japanese, but uh, I have a lot of Japanese friends, and they do, have been there many times. And the more I get to know them, the more I get to know the ones who can speak rather good English, I suppose it means. Um, the more I realise that we both have this tradition of silliness. We are both very silly countries. We like pissing around. We like using the old traditions of our country to, to hide behind. And actually, gossip and silly toys and stories and silly things that people do give a certain sort of frisson uh, to the, or, or ought to give a certain frisson to the architecture. Uh, whether that's to do with being a detached, damp island, I'm not sure. Whether that's to do with a certain sort of ability of the island to be essentially part of the culture of the mainland, but offshore. And whether it's also to do with, and where that comes from, I don't know, a sort of short memory fuse. I, I, my, my contention would be that in, in England, uh, we have gained most of our philosophies and our large parts of our culture and inspiration and so on from the mainland. But we get bored very quickly and we don't like to be told what to do very well. And so as soon as a, a philosophy is half understood or half developed, we get bored. Well, okay, done that, been there. Let's think, well, how could you turn it on its side? How could you turn it on its back? How could you distort it? And um, I think the Japanese from my observation, have very similar instincts. It makes it rather tiresome uh, for the non-English observer and English people who come on juries, certainly somebody like me, have a tendency to enjoy going off the point because the point is very obvious or very boring or very, very repetitive or the rest of the jury are all members of the club. 
and you know, you know, okay, so they're, t they're sort of satisfying each other's uh, a priori opinions. So you want to be a bit naughty and say, what happens if we, somebody throws in another idea? Let's go off the point and see if they're still thinking, uh, which is sort of quite arrogant, I suppose. Um, or what happens here in a, in, a, in a remote piece of Wales where some guy comes along and builds a three-quarter full-sized town? Appar I haven't been to Fort Merion, but apparently everything is three-quarters full-sized, rather like the King Holt's um, bar. So this is a bad photograph, doesn't matter. This was suddenly modern architecture hit. It hit rather less than it did in even smaller countries. If you go to somewhere, this friend of mine from Oslo sitting in the front here, I think there are probably as many reasonably okay, if not more reasonably okay, modernist buildings in Oslo, which is a tenth of the size of London, uh, than there are in London. It was probably even a 20th of the size of London at the time that they were built, um, which is an extraordinary thought. You know. and, and virtually everywhere else in Europe, and quite a lot of places that aren't in Europe, they, they picked up on the modernist ethos, and they did it. This, this building, in fact, was done by the guy that did Simpsons in Piccadilly and, and uh, the modernist bit of Olympia, a man called Emberton, who was actually... I believe, a commercial architect. He wasn't really a sort of pure guy. He, he could do modern if, if asked, or maybe he wanted to. And uh, he did this, which is a yacht club in, in Essex. I think it's Burnham on Crouch. I, my cynical suspicion is that because it was a yacht club, he could get away with it, because there's this other aspect of, 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 of the English psyche, which is called messing around in boats. If you do things on a boat, it's not real. Like, there's also messing around on the beach. I think there's a certain thing where a culture that's usually a little bit uptight, at least to the front, silly on the, on the quiet, but uptight in the front. If you're in a boat, or if you're by the water, or if you're on the beach, you can piss around, even architecturally. But as soon as you get into town, you've got to sort of, you know, put on a suit and play it correctly. But... There were, of course, people in history, and, and my favourite of these is Hawksmoor, and I'm going to just run through two or three Hawksmoor buildings to suggest that this guy who had been the kind of assistant of Christopher Wren uh, was actually a much better architect, much gutsier architect than Wren, much more intriguing architect than Wren, and really did tough, highly sculptural stuff, uh, went right to the edges of, of, of classicism and, beyond, and really beyond. Broke pediment, did deep troughs of thing, twisted the geometry suddenly, you know, had almost a uh, sort of eastern promise towers coming out of the back. Very, very strange stuff. And at the same, almost the same date, we've moved, just for those who like to know the titles of things, from St. George in the city to St. George at Bloomsbury, ostensibly a little bit more correct, but not when you start looking at it. Again, he seemed to enjoy putting several buildings together in one building. So there's a sort of top building, a lower building, a miniaturized piece of, of uh, total building, and then a strange sort of hat on the top of it. Naughty stuff, witty stuff. Uh, and then here he is. Uh, somewhere else, this is uh, uh, the hospital fields, the famous. Well, I think everybody knows this one because it's near the market. So, you know, virtually everybody who visits London gets a bit of high-class architecture, even if they don't know they're walking past it because they're on their way from, uh, you know, Spitalfields Market to, to, uh, to Brick Lane. And so you can have your curry and still get sort of high culture, which is the way to do it. And then we get, a hundred years later, uh, a whole row of churches that were built <coughs> as London was expanding, uh, <coughs> a la mode, but with nothing of the same guts. Just because it's got columns in the right place and looks as if it, as if it ought to be sort of looked after, uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily good. And I think 
uh, having been a child for part of my childhood in Norwich, which has still 40 medieval churches. It's not quite once you've seen one, you've seen the lot, but some are good and some are crap, but they just happen to be medieval. And as soon as they're medieval, oh, medieval. Oh. It's a sort of really third rate, a lot of them. And I think that one, you know, I'm, and that's why I'm a sort of, not exactly an anti-preservationist, I think, for goodness sake, let's keep, keep our senses about us. There are good buildings of every period, and there are bad buildings of every period. And most of the stuff is a bit of this and a bit of that, which, of course, appeals to me as a person, again, the English tendency, which is to enjoy uh, the second rate. In fact, the late Cedric Price used to always say to me, oh, you rather enjoy second rate buildings, don't you? And I say, yeah, in the same way that you enjoy reading funny newspapers <laughs> with, with odd bits of information. Uh, you enjoy the things about your friends, which are their sort of Achilles heel. And I, I don't know whether that is a particularly English characteristic. There is, of course, romantic heroism. I think we get much, we get on much safer ground when we're being rea romantic, where, in a sense, in the, it is part of the brief to go into a sort of winsome, escapist mode. Uh, I think this is Fonthill. Uh, whether it ever had the spire, I'm not, I, you remember, I'm no historian, I, I, but um, it intrigues me that it, it might have had a spire, wanted to have a spire. And it's absolutely as extraordinary as anything in Dubai at the time. And then you get the export, that this is, uh, after all, a guy uh, of roughly French origin who really became the most exotic of the wedding cake gothicists, this is Pugin, uh, but doing a church for Belgium. I like things like that. What, what, so what is it culturally? Is it Belgian? Is it French? Is it English? Because the guy was born in England, but actually his dad was French, but, but he was doing it in Belgium. Did he take any account of it being in Belgium? Or could, have, could it have been in Norwich? Uh, it, and it's sort of spooky, uh, which is also very important, I think. I think we like spooky things. Uh, perhaps if you have too big a budget, they get less good. Uh, and, of course, in a way, the attraction of Swiss Ray compared with other office blocks is the same attra attraction, I think, as, as the... Um, Albert Memorial, you know, it's a bit more funky and it vaguely looks like something. Sorry, I've gone. It looks a bit more like something than the stuff around it. Therefore, it gets awards and it's all right. And it has a good room at the top, actually, if any of you can get access to it, which I did once. It is one of London's best rooms, simply because it's a funny shape and it's very high up. That, those are very low cri architectural criteria. But on the other hand, how many things are rather ordinary shape and not very high up? You know, better a funny shape and high up. That gives you a head start. All you've got to do is to make sure the food's good and you're in business, really. Interesting when architects do their own house. I, I, my big grumble is that rich art, very few wealthy architects or architects who could afford to build in London during my lifetime, have actually bothered to do so. Uh, many years ago, Leon Creer, the rationalist from Luxembourg, who now lives in France, uh, went around town photographing everybody's where, where everybody lived, including me at the time. And we all lived in sort of Victorian or Edwardian terrace houses or whatever, uh, basically because that's what you could afford that gave you a reasonable sized room. Uh, but made a great point. He said, all these modern guys, th there they are living in these Edwardian and Victorian houses. Uh, but there are quite a, I mean, believe it or not, there are quite a lot of architects in this city who could afford, not, not thousands, but certainly a few dozen, who could afford to build a house and don't. They use all sorts of excuses. Even Richard Rogers has gutted a house in Chelsea, and it's quite exciting when you go in because it's sort of, you know, all those windows on the outside don't have any, anything behind them. It's just space. And then there's a sort of high-tech stair that goes up. But um, even if you count that as new, there's still very, very few of them. Uh, but Vanbra did. And Frofruity, another, another ex-assistant of, of 
of Christopher Wren. It, it, for a fruity theatrical guy, he went for a sort of memory of history. Though he was doing classicism as his sort of day job, when it came to his own house, he went for building a castle in a London suburb. Uh, at least he put his he put his his money where his mouth was, or well, not where his mouth not where his mouth was expected to be, but where he wanted it to be. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, and and you know, I was inspired by reading books when I was still in Bournemouth about the 19th century. I guess it was <laughs> a bit closer to the 19th century than you were, though not not as close as that, and one would read about the enormous battles that there were in London between the Romantics and the, Go and, and the Classicists. It was a major, major battle, although one can cynically observe that after all, Pugin was hired to do a wraparound job on Barry's neoclassic plan. So presumably, <laughs> there was a certain moment at which it, it suited both parties. You know, and Pugin certainly did a better job of it, perhaps, than Barry would have done, although that's debatable. But, I mean, the interesting thing is these people who were symbols of two opposite camps did a bit of a deal in a bar or wherever it was they did the deal. And, and the result is actually uh, surprisingly successful, which leads one then to say, what about the whole question of mannerism and style? Is it purely a means to the end? Is it possible for a building to be both Pugsley and Hyde? Am I wearing pink spotted underwear under my black garb? I'm allowing, of course, a little bit of pink to show. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not. I don't own any, but I might be. Uh, and that would be rather the same. Terrible analogy, actually. Um, this kind of strange combination intrigues me a lot. Uh, because it's actually a gatehouse for almshouses, which were uh, buildings built for the poor in Penge, which is a sort of joke, joke place in the English psychology. Anyhow, Penge is one of those silly names like, like um, Acton or, 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 or uh, those places on the tube that you never go to. But it had a piece of sort of self-conscious Aren't we English and historic? Those, those particular sort of neo-Tudor uh, tops <coughs> crop up. I went to a school once that had neo-Tudor tops, and at the end of my street where I live now, there's a street with neo-Tudor tops. It somehow, if you wanted sort of class and quality, but it didn't cost you too much, then you bit this old wood and, wood and uh, metal up there, you did Tudor tops. Because Tudor tops mean sort of class and, and academe and reasonableness. Uh, and you can have any old rubbish underneath them, really. So Tudor, Tudor was interesting because it, was, it could be used in, in, in the middle of the 19th century because it was neither classic nor was it romantic gothic. It was kind of a bit sitting on the fence. The really interesting piece, of course, used Neo-Egyptian. But you have to be rather good to do that. I think Tudor was easier. Uh, and I'm intrigued about that. And when we get to the famous Strawberry Hill, which was built by a rich, cultured man who was the son of a prime minister, um, it, it, you get, which was a man called Horace Walpole, a building built so that he could entertain, so that he could have salons and concerts and all sorts of things. And it became known, uh, there was a catchphrase, which was called Strawberry Hill Gothic, if you look at the building, it's not really any more Gothic than anything. It's a mixture of bits of Gothic thrown onto bits of castle, bits of almost near Tudor, bits of kind of the sort of castle you see in, 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 in stories where, you know, the knight comes and ri rides away with the lady or has to kill dragons. It's a sort of, it's a sort of joke, basically, but the, but the chimneys are vaguely Tudor. Um, it was a, a pastiche that appealed to all takers. Um, what the plan is like, I don't know. I, I now, if you grew up 
between the ages of 10 and 14 in a town called Ipswich, as I did, and then moved away and didn't go back there for years and years and years. When this thing landed in Ipswich, I, and I saw it for the first time, I could not believe it. Ipswich, apart from nasty murders and stuff, is a second-rate football team, is, is, is a very ordinary town. It's a sort of Midland town transposed into East Anglia. It has none of the charm of Norwich, but I digress. Uh, it was a very, very ordinary place. You know, the family cook comes from Ipswich, but apart from that, it's no interest at all for me. Um, and to suddenly think of this black glass turd arriving in the middle of Ipswich and reflecting a second-rate street. And it, I, I, I apologize, I tried, and I came to back at last night to find a better slide, but you get you all see, I presume, the famous, uh, famous piece of Foster work of, of the high period. Um, and it was extraordinary, a black glass, oddly shaped building landing in the middle of a very ordinary town and reflecting and glorifying the town in the reflection of its windows. Or added to which it was an office block which was dominated by a swimming pool, which you could just see through the windows, uh, and has a lawn on the top of it. Again, there's an extraordinary thing. At that time, it's been imitated many, many times, but you know, 25 years ago, whenever it was, it was extraordinary. And it said, well, you could land uh, erotic, transposed, off-from-the-moon off architecture, which this, relatively speaking, is, is or was, uh, anywhere. To hell with context. All it does contextually is to follow the, the, the available building line. And in a way, I suppose, subconsciously, and I've only just thought of it this minute, uh, is what we did in Glass. You know, used to take the available envelope and land your thing on it. Um, though Graz has, as a town, rather more charm than Ipswich, believe me. But it does raise a very interesting question. And it was a local product. It wasn't as if it was like Colin and I, who were foreigners, coming into Graz and doing a thing. This was done by people, I think Burke and Hayward, who worked on it, actually came from East Anglia. So it was even it was almost local boys coming and doing a very, very naughty thing uh, with the full knowledge of the kind of town that they were dropping into. And that, I think, is altogether far more exotic than the sort of revivalist stuff that is... That, uh, ennobled those conversations in the 19th century. I, I just leave that as a sort of dangling thought, as a dangling thought, lest we become too nostalgic, lest we become too concerned about the minutiae of a local particular culture. Look, given bravery and wit, and a pretty fast company in, in the team at that point, uh, you can land such an object into a place and the story changes, the whole story changes. And years later, you know, it becomes a coveted object of, of the local culture. Or you do this sort of thing, which is sort of hilarious in a way. It's just an effect of your toy. You look at the top part and you say, well, yeah, there's a little room where the sort of child of the family can look out and there's another piece where maybe you take lunch. But no, it's a church. For goodness sake, it's a church. What's it doing looking like a bit of a house? Very, very, very strange. And I've lost the caption because I'd never seen it before. It's St. John's Church in Hopwas in Staffordshire, 1881, by somebody called John Douglas. Very intriguing thing to do, though. And, and he couldn't keep up it, could he? Because even the way that it looks as if 
the end, was he sort of anti-religious or something? He didn't really, he wanted to pretend it was a house, but actually the commission was for a church, you know, rather like sort of doing a pub but making it look like a clinic or whatever. I mean, I can think of lots of analogies. Um, I'm intrigued. Um, and you have to, it's a complete opposite condition from the Ipswich condition. Whereas, in a way, you know, this is also a church uh, trying to look like a piece of city. Um, and this is in Hackney, so we can all go and have a look at that by somebody else I've never heard of before called James Brooks. Similar-ish sort of date, 1862, not so far away. Uh, that's an odd one, unless um, maybe there was a special brief in the piece on the right-hand side. Somebody's going to tell me, ah, it doesn't look entirely like a church because actually it's a school as well or something. Uh, the old functionalist training, you see, is still there. There's another... There's another thing about not all of you are North Europeans either, and, and um, there's a sort of piety that comes with being a North European, the old sort of Calvinist underbelly, and I find uh, that's why perhaps one understands the psychology of the, of the, the uh, Scandinavians a little more than some others, because <coughs> we all have that thing as if we ought to be doing the right thing. And I look at that, and, and one of my, you see, I, I fall into an, a, a terrible North European trap, which is to say, well, there seems to be a lot going on, so I'm sure the brief included, you know, a hospital, a school, a dog's home, or something else. All, all, all this stuff, there's the church, there, and all this stuff, I'm sure, was very useful. But there's nothing to do with this brief. This is pretty rare. I mean, it could be just a, a sort of large room so that they could enjoy themselves in. Oh, no must be doing useful things, including in the second university in Sheffield, England. must be a room for whatever. Uh, which is a sort of, you know, we, we have only when we're at the seaside or on boats do we do funny things. Though there was a period when you had a basically straight up and down house frilly, uh, the cottage orné. So in order to justify it, perhaps borrowing a piece of pseudo-French, I'm not sure, and I, again, you have to remember, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a designer, I think, whatever. Uh, and, and I'm intrigued that perhaps if you wanted to piss about, you gave it a foreign name, rather like you do in second-rate restaurants. Um, so that that was all right, that, 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 that under pressure you would say, no, it's a cottage or nay. I'm not sure that the French actually had cottage or nay. Well, I'm sure there's somebody sitting here who could correct me on that point. There's a certain kind of, so that same Puritanism, which was certainly not extant here, because here the conversation was complicated. I was brought up reading books and being taught that the really important thing about the railway stations of London were that they were fantastic pieces of engineering. They were these great sheds where the English engineers, who have always been more experimental than many others, <coughs> or Scottish engineers as well, pushed, pushed the potential of iron and steel and wood, but particularly the metals, pushed them to the extent where, where, where a little, another you know, a couple of centimetres and the thing would collapse. I mean, English engineers, anybody I've ever worked with, have always been <coughs> at pains to try and push, push the thing to the limit and to try and stop it in there. Right from the time when I was a fourth-year student here, and you automatically work with a young, bright young guy from Arabs. I don't know where that still obtains, but it's, I think, a very important piece of the, the tradition. But... In this particular case, you had this wonderful shed at the back, and then you put a cake on the front of it so you could make some money out of it. And it, unlike the Houses of Parliament, where the cake is a, is a, a frill, as it were, in this cake, the case, cake is on the front, and there's a very definite moment at which you come out of the cake and you go into the shed. And we've all been, you know, 
every newspaper has been wanting us to celebrate this shed in the last few weeks because the Eurostar now dumps you there. And um, the cake is about intriguingly, and again, you've got to wa watch my s North European psychology. It was designed as a hotel. Then it became offices which fell into disrepair. I don't know why. Then it was empty for a long time. There was a period when it was being looked over by University College and other places to perhaps put people being taught in there, but it wasn't suitable. Where do you think it has turned to being a hotel? I like that. I think I showed you that example, did I not, of the, of the water tower that looked like a house, stopped being a water tower and returned to being a house. Uh, things like that are fascinating because we have, after all, uh, grown used in, I think, every, every place that we all come from to the idea that most of the buildings that we seem to use uh, were not necessarily designed for what we use them for. They seem to work fairly well, which is a great sort of kick in the teeth for functionalism in a way. Uh, it's all you've got to do is to keep the weather out and you're in business. It's a very primitive way of looking about architecture, but worth mentioning. Um, and, of course, the interior was exotic. Uh, presumably the restoration will wallow in it being like that again. In a way, second-rate buildings have just as much, this is back to Cedric's quip to me many years ago, second-rate buildings have, have a fascination because this does all the things that buildings shouldn't do. It's a theatre. You probably all pass it by every day. Uh, it's got far too many windows and far too much attempts at architecture going on and doesn't know its ass from its elbow, but it nonetheless seems very Londony. Maybe that's just as if you live in London long enough, you get, you get immune to buildings that are sort of <coughs> over fussy. And it is one of the English characteristics that we have difficulty in, in leaving well alone. Just as we don't like straightforward polemics, and straightforward political positions, but we, we much more, or, or, or plays where the hero is the hero and the villain is the villain and the beautiful girl is the beautiful girl, because actually the beautiful girl is a bit of a villain and the hero is not as nice as you think and the, the villain has certain mitigating circumstances that perhaps are hinted at. And then there's a subplot to the, in, in novels, a subplot to the subplot to the subplot to the subplot. And I think English architecture has a, we always have a tendency to say, well, of course what you do is this and this and this, that's how it's going to work. But wouldn't it be, are there possibilities, like the two children, are there possibilities that perhaps there could be something else happening? And that, in our, in our funny, muddled, romantic minds, gets to be more important than the, the first bit, because anybody can do a building that works. <laughs> Let's now make it not work. Let's make it confused. Or make it have overturns. This is, this is a, a sort of very good second-rate building around the corner here. Um, and it's the, um, the, uh, the what's it called, Marriott Ward House. Uh, and it's 1895 in a sort of English arts and crafts mode. Now, the arts and crafts movement is a very curious sort of example of double think, though parallel movements existed, of course, in Germany also, uh, <coughs> and where there was this belief that if we not only went spiritually back to medieval times, but even operationally went back to medieval times, and that people could weave their own weaving and make their own bricks, and it was back to the, sort of the, the, beautiful, the beautiful peasant um, but you had to use, <laughs> at a practical level, you, you had to use sort of modern techniques as well. So sometimes you use one, sometimes you use the other. It's rather like we, we're, we're leaning over backwards uh, with, you know, going to a supermarket but buying organic food. You sort of buy the organic food until it gets really expensive. And then you say, well, I'll cheat, I'll cheat on the tomatoes. <laughs> I'll cheat on the soup. But that was organic and it's pure and truthful and wonderful, but 
Fucking hell, the potatoes are a bit expensive, look grotty. So I'll go, well, you know, it'd be all right if I just have potatoes, it's not organic, because that's all right, really. It was the same here where they said, you know, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do beautiful handmade windows um, <coughs> and we'll do sort of things that look as if it's taken from a cottage with a bit of neoclassic some until um, it gets a bit expensive and then we'll just do the back like they regularly do it here. And I'm, I'm, my cynicism is intrigued by that because when we look at architecture very often, and, and in a funny way it gets more duplicitous the more educated we are, the more cynical we are, the more you can get from a building what you want to read from it, unless it's really bad, in which case forget it, but, you know, from the moderate, you know, or you can get from a corner of something. Here is a corner of the House of the Parliament, but seen in this particular picture, all the repetitiveness is taken away from it. And what we see is a nice bit of almost villagey muddle. It's just by the distortion of the, the photograph taken from a certain place where it looks as if it's some very small-scale romantic art cross. We know it to be a bloody large building with a lot of, of repeat to it. And I find things like that fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I return again, I think, for the second time to a bit of Heath Robinson, the cartoonist, who was operational largely in the period from about, I think, 1920 to, or 1910 to 1940, and therefore ahead of my generation, but still a household word. I mean, I grew up where my parents would refer to any funny contraption as, as a piece of Heath Robinson. And even uh, colleagues much younger than myself, like C.J. Lim, gives lectures about Heath Robinson. How could he have known? He's still only in his early 40s and came from Malaysia, for Christ's sake. But has, since he's lived in England, has got more and more fascinated by Heath Robinson, which has perhaps, dare I say it, and I noticed there are one or two Bartlett people sitting at the back, uh, has more resonance in the Bartlett than it would in the AA at this present moment. Uh, because the Bartlett writes minute inventions and the AA is more doctrinaire. And therefore, this stuff, which is sort of <laughs> invention taken to ridiculous point, has a resonance for some of us who are, in, who are intrigued by the gadget, the maneuver, the silly. Uh, gadgets which are for very, very silly things. But I would contend that there's an element of, you know, what did... British, there's, a, there's another lecture which I'm not going to give in this series, but it's beginning to build up in my head, which is called Whatever Happened to High Tech? Because I think that British high tech owes partly to the high conversations uh, like, you know, Chicago, Buckminster Fuller, uh, New Ways with Steel, uh, Mies van der Rohe and all of that, but also to things like Heath Robinson. And I can remember some of the key figures of high tech still with their legs poking out underneath cars that should have been the centre of a scrap heap. But it was much more interesting to try and make them work, which again is a very funny English perversity. That, that the obvious thing is to send the bloody thing to the scrap heap and maybe can reweave the wheels. But no, the challenge, since we were the generation that didn't have to fight the Second World War, the challenge was to make it work, even if it cost you twice as much and six weekends, and you couldn't quite get the piece of rubber that was needed between the second spigot and the fourth valve or whatever. I mean, I don't drive, but uh, I, all, all, the, all the early high-tech people. So when finally in the University of East Anglia, the Foster Office pronounced that they had used the longest continuous gasket in the world, we said, whoo! Sort of like it was better than using it on, on an old clapped out Ford, uh, but it was really just a mess of the building. Now, all of you and your friends come to London because it, it might have funny, funny things. This is Camden Market or somewhere. And I think there's the same underbelly of culture that is represented by Camden Market because most of the stuff is sort of, forget where it's made, but, but most of it, even if there's a Union Jack poking up, most of it is sort of tack, but it's sort of, hope is that it's interesting tack. 
interesting tacky stuff. And I think, I suddenly wonder, is that what English architecture and culture is about? This interesting tacky, where if you just had, you know, suits lined up like they are in, 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 in H&M or CNA or even Selfridges or so, um, that's too predictable. Yes, of course they work and the lining won't split and, you know, good value and the buttons are sewn on reasonably. Whereas here you might get, God knows what you might find. But, you know, it might have even come from the same factory, actually. Um, and I think that there's that, which is, again, counterposed by, this is Heath Robinson talking about architecture, or at least drawing about architecture. This was Heath Robinson suggesting something that I might have come up with. And in my Wednesday lecture, you'll see plenty of suggestions whereby vegetation can be worked into new architecture. And there was Heath Robinson, who was not an architect, suggesting that you could have a contraption that would bring the garden up to what is very clearly his take on a piece of modernism. You know, Eric Mendelssohn meets the, meets the uh, flower pot. And uh, I, don't, I think he was a bit of a, of a Luddite when it came to architecture, but nonetheless, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful take, that particular site. So what did happen to England when it faced up to modern, when it seriously started to face up to modern, which was actually after the Second World War, having established that before the Second World War, apart from a few, you know, penguin pools and blocks of flats, it, it did very, it was very, very offshore. It was very suspicious. And I was reading in... Uh, one of the A publications, the moment when Le Corbusier spoke in this room, the only time that he ever spoke in England, he presumably spoke in French, but that extraordinarily, you know, not very far away, nobody else had bothered to bring him over. Nobody else had even thought about it, presumably. It's extraordinary. Okay, so the people who taught me when I was here public school Marxists who admired Le Corbusier and were very, very brilliant teachers, the best of them being a man called John Killick. And they built this particular estate for what was then called the London County Council. But intriguingly, the, London, the same London County Council just down the hill at Roehampton had another similar-sized estate done by the people who believed in Swedish modernism, which was supposed to be more humane had pitch roofs, very, very do-goody, not quasi-high architecture, not tough, brutal, concrete galleries, Le Corbusier architecture, but a sort of, you know, gentle, homey. It'd be very interesting to know, uh, maybe I don't know the answer, but, but I, thought, I thought I would like to know the answer, of which of the two estates at this moment now, 50 years later, is the more useful and the more admired, or are they actually the same? Have they still got, have they both got the kitchen in the same location? Did they s use the same door handle? I'm not sure, I don't know the answer. Uh, or Patrick Hodgkinson, again, all of these people were educated in this, in this school, uh, who made something that had allusions to fut futurist architecture. If you look at Santalia, and then you look at the section here. Uh, if you also uh, look at the French architect Henri Sauvage, uh, and then look at this section. But it's high architecture which fell into not only disrepair but disrepute, and now, as you well know, uh, has you know has the local branch of Carluccio's underneath it, so all is well in the world. Uh, and perhaps more interesting and more, more vicious near where I live is, is the famous Alexandra Road made by the loud voice Neve Brown. Uh, I think a, a brilliant piece of architecture in its way, having to deal with a very noisy railroad that runs just behind it. <coughs> and it's still, it's still sort of honoured by the sort of people who like it. But my wife, who comes from Tel Aviv, says, my God, you know, if this was in Tel Aviv, it 
people would really enjoy it. And she's suspicious. She still carries her suspicions on from when she was an A student that the English don't quite take to being organized as, as much as that. She says, I'm wondering whether are they really enjoying it? They don't not that much. She's not quite convinced that they are. It's a bit too ordered, a bit too clever a section. Uh, at, though it is possible for English architects, again, Dennis Lansman, who also was a student at this school, uh, somehow found a way in his later work, after the National Theatre, of finding a level of elegance that was still fine-grained enough to be English. Here is a house by a, an emigre Russian, Lubetkin, now lived in by that king of the high tech um, who, who is, is um, Mike Davis. Interesting to think that Mike Davis in his later years has been spending all his weekends restoring the Lubetkin house, which he now has as his country house. And, and in a way, so I think that's a piece of, you know, the, 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 the quintessentially British fiddling with machines architect who was responsible for the, the dome and many other high-tech, but, but one of the real, real inventors of, of that office. Uh, in the end, he honors high architecture made by a foreigner, albeit looking over a quintessentially English countryside. Looks at Luton in the other direction, which is best left unsaid. And one wonders what the current mode has to say to that. Here is something, I can't even remember the name of the architect. I just snapped it out of uh, last week or the week before BD. And it is a sort of piece of useful, ecologically correct um, house somewhere in a, in a market garden, it looks like. And it's doing all the right things. Uh, but doesn't have the balls of that. Maybe it doesn't want to. But I wonder, I wonder where have we gone? Or do we do we go sideways? Another product of the A is, my, uh, is Piers Goff, who I have to admit was a student of mine, and still one of the most amusing people uh, in London architecture, doing a naughty. Piers Goff went right the way through doing noughties and continued somehow because he had some sort of pliant uh, colleagues and developers from time to time, has continued to do noughties. In fact, now his architecture is getting less naughty, uh, which is a pity. But he did a blue building. We've all done blue buildings and he did his in South London. Uh, when you go close, you see that actually it's quite sensibly detail, and there's a little bit even, dare I suggest it, of the high tech about the, the detail. Not really true high tech, but it's not quite as fruitcake as you would expect if you pursue it in. So the fruit is made in the basic uh, statement. And after all, his other building around the corner, uh, the red one, when you put it into a sort of collage, it's not a collage, it's actually just a straight photograph, but when you put it into the collage, represented by the riverside, it is much less extraordinary. It almost could be a piece of domesticated hawk's moss uh, uh, and has the same balcony <laughs> detail as the building around the corner. Why not? And then we come right up to date with Fat, who I have difficulty enjoying Though, is this my narrow-mindedness? Why can I enjoy Piers Goff and not enjoy fat? Is it because somehow the Piers Goff building is still the product of a degree of invention, whereas the fat building is the product of a different generation that is more interested in the overall effect? I'm not sure. I know all the people too well to be objective. This which fights everything that I was brought up on, 
Uh, do I accept it when it's done by an older architect who is, after all, a, a contemporary of mine, which is Jeremy Dixon, which when he built these houses and made a veil about, I guess, 25 or so years ago, shocked all his friends. He said, Jeremy, how can you do such a thing? <laughs> and now it's almost indistinguishable from, from the rest. Uh, Recreative style is very difficult. It was, after all, done also in the Festival of Britain, alongside the earlier south, south of the River Dome, <coughs> which is an extraordinary object, probably more extraordinary than the current dome. Uh, there was this kind of toy town. It looks, does it not, like one of those railway models? You expect it to be... <laughs> it's not a railway model. I don't think it's a model. I think it's the actual... Yes, there's a real car there the actual building in Poplar when it was built in uh, 1951. Extraordinary toy quality. But then after all, the toy quality is, is encouraged by so-called popular opinion. This is Coyne Street on the south bank of the Thames. You can see where it is vis-a-vis -vis the Oxo Tower. And this housing here seemingly Rogers project for the same site that would have put sort of bold glass slabs. And I, I think it's interesting to see it in this sort of aerial photograph where it is part again of a sort of funny, funny collage. It's the moment at which the feebleness of being English is sometimes embarrassing. Though a powerful, bold, well-connected person can break through that, as Nash did with his Regent Street, Regent's Park um, development in St. James. What he did, what's interesting about it is that unlike We find it difficult to stick with a simple moment. And, of course, in the, in the parts that are now more or less <coughs> not much there, uh, you can see that, that he, too, enjoyed to use disparate pieces at these changes of direction, as we see with the church. It's near the BBC, uh, All Souls Langham Place. Uh, he turned to advantage the moments when the thing couldn't just be driven through. So maybe he didn't even want to. That becomes part then of a narrative. And I think there is this narrative aspect of English thinking in architecture, which is a very interesting one. And I come to the Smithsons, who I touched upon in an earlier lecture, as personifying many of the paradoxes of the English mind. They are, after all, they were from the north of England. Peter was my fifth year tutor when I was at this place, uh, Alison used to come onto juries and be very tough and bitchy, uh, but I came to like her in la later life. Uh, the cover of the definitive book does a bit of a naughty. It tries to solemnify the Smithsons. And my, my, my disagreement with many of these sort of uh, whispering school of architects in this town at the moment is that they use the Smithsons and, the, and, and, and books such as Without Rhetoric as a sort of support for this suppressed, calm, slightly bitchy aspect of the Smithsons. Whereas, in fact, uh, I think a lot of what they did is much nuttier. Even late in life, the last book that, after Alison had died, Peter did with a, uh, a, a former student, a German student of mine, Carl, um, it's nutty. It's a funny shape book with a funny object on it, which is a sort of part recherche and part straightforward device. 
a link through surely to that other aspect of the, the leg sticking out of the old old uh, Ford of the of the high tech, and yet then returning in theoretical pieces about housing, returning to in a way Yorkshire in order to illustrate certain points for Dubrovnik. Uh, there were contemporaries of theirs. After all, Howell and Partridge were two of the guys who were doing those Roehampton apartments, those big Corbusian blocks. But when pushed to deal with small housing, were looking very similarly uh, to the Smithsons. And Sterling even, there was a certain sort of neo-vernacular. Do I sense, do I sniff that they may have been paralleled with not exactly arts and crafts, but, but pre-selecting certain moments in a, an almost bucolic English way of life and doing buildings. And even more interesting, some of you may have even been taught recently by Peter Salter. And Peter Salter was for many years an assistant at the Smithson. It's interesting to see the difference between the, the Peter Smithson scribble of this project and the Salter plan, uh, being a trusted person in the office, he was permitted to start to see more, yes, to see more opportunities, really, I thought, more quirky in the Smithson plan. The Smithson established the Smithson layout. People start seeing more and more where he thought about it. Uh, so that it's one generation of English preference upon another. And I deliberately put this in to throw the conversation because this is the Smithsons doing offices for the Iraqi airline long since pulled down. They did a spell of sculptural exotica. They weren't above doing that. I think that, that the history of the Smithsons has to be rewritten yet again. And after all, they were involved in an exhibition um, called Parallels of Life and Art. There was a lot of stuff, if you dig around, there was a lot of stuff going on at the moment at which places like the ICA and the independent group, which involved the Smithsons among them, Palazzi, all those guys, um, were asserting themselves as not being a dull provincial offshore island, but still were using the intrinsic liking of, of collecting funny toys that the English always have. Uh, and that's gone right through to much more mainstream, more recent stuff, where you see that English museums rather enjoy collecting toys and having funny juxtapositions. What happens when they try and be neo-historical functional vernacular gets a bit to the edge. This is, this is, I think, that development down on the South Bank um, for Hayes Wharf, and it, it's trying to be Victorian, but of course it isn't really only a bit. And I think to the trained eye, doesn't do it. Doesn't do it as daringly as the, the old guys would have done. The structure is much more heavy and much more, you know, thinking about fire regulations and factors of safety and cheap pieces of steel or whatever it might be. Uh, and even third-rate architecture. This is likely to be pulled down, and there'll be a lot of wringing of hands. But let's face it, it's very second, third-rate Smithfield. Uh, but even that does its engineering quite cleverly. And we've even got to the point where now, of course, high-tech is, is a historical style, incorporating buildings that are no longer used. Now, that's a shock. Uh, there's been a lot of praise for the conversion, the cleaning up, really, of, of St. Pancras. But St. Pancras never had to deal with a curved track. And as somebody who uses the Eurostar a great deal, it, it's, it was actually slightly more comfortable to arrive on a carpeted floor than on that rather sort of shrill, hard surface floor with the draft 
flowing around your legs. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that everybody's enjoying St. Pancras because it falls into that lovely recherche trap. We are using this wonderful shed, it says. You know, the fact we're slightly less comfortable using it, we won't talk about. And I think that, that buildings such as the Grimshaw one needs a reappraisal. It was, after all, part of a, of a very special moment in English architecture. Well, the moment is long after this one, but the, the pushing of the shed concept. Uh, even early uh, high-tech is something that I, thi I think it's, it's an uncomfortable, possibly an uncomfortable truth, that it is high-tech which was our highest moment in English architecture, but it's no longer fashionable. Interesting. What do you do about that? Huh. Tough ship. No longer fashionable. So we did it. There you are. But to what extent it has left something which is unavailable? This is actually Foster and Rogers when they were working together before they had their own firms when they were something called Team 4. I just thought it was a sort of a, a amusing historical interest. And even, even somebody who's not thought of as a high-tech architect nonetheless borrows certain aspects of, of the, the invention tradition uh, such as Ted Cullinan here. Uh, and certain architects use a, a kind of developed version of it, which is less pure, such as Ian Ritchie, uh, or look at Victorian models, such as McCormack, when also doing a tube station. These are both tube stations on the Jubilee line, uh, where the, the, the sort of industrial tradition is dug out and used as part of a current aesthetic. I wanted to use Channel 4, which is less consistent than, than this, but the, the, but the digitalization of my picture was so bad last night that I ditched it at the last minute. Um, I would rather use Channel 4 because it's more interesting as a, as a mixture of, of mannerisms than this. Uh, but it will have to do to remind you that when we pick up BD, which most of us who operate in this town do, because two copies arrive on the doorstep. Um, the chitcha, the day-to-day -day culture, revolves around this kind of thing. I can't remember who did it, and I don't want to be bothered to remember who did it. it, it it's what I think we really have to fight, which is sort of a kind of let's please everybody kind of architecture. You know, it's sort of technical enough, it's sort of gentle enough, it sort of reflects the vegetation enough, and there's a bit of veg there, but it's sort of good for climate control, and it's not too high and not too low, and everybody's very pleasant, and there's somebody in a wheelchair in the foreground, so that's <laughs> all right. And, and I, it just makes you want to throw, I mean, it just makes you want to do something else, you know? <laughs> I, 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 I've always had a, a studied disinterest. But that's what most of you will be working on if you hang around. Uh, okay, a more interesting man, Eric Parry, but he's more talented than that. And sometimes I get sad when, you know, it's a nice building, but it's, all, it's only sort of bits of mathematics. In the end, it's still business as usual, and he's more talented than that, but maybe he wants to live comfortably. Uh, or Chipperfield, who after all is the hero, uh, in his more English moment, though his, his office isn't very English, um, being sort of reasonable and wooden and boarded and get a tree, or even, you know, um, Agile, who one hopes has the talent to become less local because though brought up locally, I have a suspicion he wants to move outside it, uh, even if he's black and cute, as Janet Street Porter describes him. Um, you can see these guys who are, are, let's face it, quite talented, you know, struggling to do a kind of local version of international architecture, but not really knowing quite where to go. I think the most, still one of the most interesting people in town, very naughty boy, but very, and, and, and lets his trousers slip 
from time to time and never has any money, but none of us do, is Will Allsop. I think he somehow has something of the combination, a bad picture, uh, has something of the combination of sort of English psychology, again, uh, again an AA product. I think all the people I've shown, just so happens, the power and influence of this school over a period, uh, all studied here at least part of the time, uh, with the exception of McCormack and with the exception of Ritchie. All the others were at work. Um, I think Willie, when he's on form, virtually pulls it off. This could just about be a Japanese building. It intrigues me. It has some characteristics that might make it a Japanese building, but it's still fundamentally very quirky. Uh, and to backtrack in time, there was another architecture that was going on in this school before I came here, when I was a, still a provincial <coughs> looking in magazines and deciding that I would move on to the AA. This stuff just hit the press. And that was weird. That was very strange stuff. It vaguely had connections perhaps with Sharoon, but it was far too exotic. It was and, and produced by... Uh, a man called Edward Reynolds who died rather young and worked for those guys on that Roehampton housing, as a matter of fact. Extraordinary stuff, which I think you could just fiddle with the photograph and drop it somewhere into uh, certainly the deconstruction show in New York a few years ago and get away with it. And there is a body of us who are not just being local, but who say, actually, the seeds of the deconstruction, which again is also out of fashion, but the seeds of deconstructivism happened in this building when a whole bank of people were teaching here. But that actually it had already been happening 20 years before that. Even. So we have the high moment, the celebration of an already dead language, which is high tech, which didn't quite tech enough, but could be put some chewing gum in it and it's all right. And uh, people like myself having a hate-hate relationship with pre-existent London buildings. And in that particular case, the HOK company who are paying me for this lecture, also paying me to piss around with a funny building in London. Um, and this finally is what I would call uh, our Benny Hill moment. Think about it. And, and um, I think it would, it, it's my favorite picture of the Graz building because it is the Benny Hill condition of the fat lady getting on the bus and Benny Hill's finger, uh, which my wife, as a non-English person, hates. She says, why is it that you're, why is it that the whole world 